The following is brought to you by the Starfleet Podcast Network, SPN, The Spin. And we were shooting a scene where uh, an actress was walking into a restaurant. We were outside this restaurant. She was walking up and going inside. And they didn't, they hadn't planned out what they wanted to do. So we got something like 30 different angles of this actress walking up to the door and opening the door and walking in because they were so unconfident in what they were you know, oh, do we need another angle? And we got 30 different angles. And I, at one point I said, like, the only thing we're missing is the doorknob's point of view. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the next shot we got. A red alert. Hey everybody, it's Big J. And in just a moment, I'll be presenting you with Interlude, a Star Trek fan film from Avalon Universe, written by Jonathan Lane. Afterwards, Please join our critical, not cynical review with special guest director of photography, Joshua Irwin. Without further ado, here's Interlude. Date 2245.1. The D7 enters the war. Helm, hold her steady. We need some distance between us and those battle cruisers. I'm trying, sir. Those monsters are fast. Damage report. Shields holding at 60%, aft torpedoes disabled, impulse engines damaged, but still operative. We have warp power, but not for long. Rage, this is engineering. God, what the hell are you doing to my ship? Alexi, divert all non-essential power to the aft shields. Keep those warp engines intact. Mr. Tanaka's on his way down to assist. Do the impossible. Duh. Same as always. Engineering out. And it's not your ship. Tom, get me the Artemis. Red line, mental conduit. Captain, two. the Ares is hailing us, sir. Captain Jukande, our main viewer, sir. Guess Karn finally got his D7s launched. Would you look at the size of those things? Status on the Artemis, Captain. Shields are at 72%. Warp and impulse engines intact. Minor casualties. So far. Just our luck, the first D7 attack would happen here. I don't believe in coincidence, Captain. Do you know what you're saying, Garth? It's the only explanation. We have a spy. Jaconde, Kane, status on comms. Communications relay overload, Captain. I'm rerouting now, just give me a minute. Franklin, damage report. Hull breach on deck six, emergency bulkheads in place. Phaser banks three and four damaged, auxiliary control circuits temporarily disabled. Casualties. Go ahead, doctor. Captain, I have Ramirez in sick bay. He's been hit. He's in critical condition. I need to operate, but I can't while the ship is being blasted apart. Understood. The ship gets blasted apart. It's not going to matter. Kane, I need comms now. Thanks for calling me back. I thought you'd hung up on me. Ramirez is in sick bay. He's critical. Get out of here, Garth. Now, we'll handle this. Jump to war with us. With any luck, we can both make it back to the fleet. No. Engineering, you Those D7s are faster than us. 
Starfleet can afford to lose both our ships plus Ramirez. We'll handle the battle cruisers. Helm, come about. Chikande, no. We'll beam Ramirez to you. We can lower our ventral shield just long enough to get. Captain, we've just taken heavy damage to the ventral power conduits. It's knocked out the transporters. Damn it. Chikande, can you beam Ramirez? Our transporters are out too. Garth, this is the only way. You've got to get Ramirez out of here now. Engineering, slow to one quarter impulse, start venting warp plasma. We've got to make it seem like we've been crippled. Yes, Captain. And Commander, be prepared to shut down antimatter containment. On my mark. But Captain, that'll destroy the ship. I know. I know. Aye, sir. Chikande. It's been an honor serving with you, Captain Garth. Now get the hell out of here. The honor is ours, Artemis. Helm, hard about. Helm, War Factor 7. Now. Shut down antimatter containment unit. Now. Matter explosion, sir. Artemis is gone. The Klingon ships are no longer pursuing us. Mr. Deville, get us back to Earth. Best speed. That ambush cost us dearly. Captain Jaconde. We were brothers in war. But thanks to the Artemis, we made it back safely to Starbase One. Admiral Ramirez survived, but he spent the rest of the war in the hospital bed. In some ways, his decision was the easy decision. Because when you're in the middle of a battle like that, you're not running through your head the calculations of the hundreds of people that are going to die or the thousands of people back home who that affects. His sacrifice was so pure because all he was thinking about was the mission. It was a federation. It was winning. He knew what had to happen and He didn't give a damn about anything else but achieving the mission. It was pure sacrifice. It was pure purpose. But that's, that's what captains do. Those are the decisions captains make. The Klingons teach their children that a true hunter always cuts the head off of the beast and eats its still beating heart. So they went after Ramirez. He had rallied the fleet, pushed for the launch of the Ares class, and turned the tide of the war. Karn thought if you cut off the head, the body would wither. But he didn't plan on us making it out. Klingons hoped that by taking out Ramirez, it would cripple our morale. But it backfired on them. The Klingons couldn't have known where we were gonna be unless someone tipped them off. Now that we knew that there was a spy, that gave us that one piece of information we needed 
to finally bring this damn war to an end. Now we knew exactly what we were up against and what it might cost us. And I knew more than ever that we needed Axnor. In the weeks following the loss of the USS Artemis, a dark shadow lingers over the Federation. The newly unleashed D-7 warships prove to be all but unstoppable, taking a devastating toll on the Federation fleet. The tide of war quickly turns, and a growing sense of urgency spreads throughout Starfleet Command. However, as preparations to execute Garth's battle plan at Axanar continue, word arrives at Earth that the Vulcan High Council has reached a fateful decision. Vulcan is withdrawing from the war, and the Federation must face this new threat without their strongest member. Welcome back to Critical Not Cynical. I am Big J. I'm here with Joshua Irwins, our special guest with Frank and V-Man. We're going to talk about Interlude, the film you just watched or listened to. It was written by Jonathan Lane, produced by him as well, directed by Victoria Fox. And Joshua was the director of photography on this one. So Joshua, as always, we are glad to have you here. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Big J. Before we really get into it, I want to have you explain to us, because I, I think I may know, but just for our audience that doesn't, what does the director of photography do? So the director of photography is responsible for basically the image that you see on the screen. Um, <clears throat> he's the painter. You know, uh, the director of photography uh, will determine a lot of times, depending on the director, um, you know, like for, for interlude, I created the shot list and I sort of designed what, what shots we would get. I designed it so that we could edit it a certain way. Um, and, you know, I was responsible basically for anything pertaining to camera and lighting is, is the best way to break it down. So I lit the set designed the sh designed and executed uh everything involving the camera the camera moves the shots all that kind of stuff now you that. operate the camera itself sorry frank mm -hmm. yeah i did okay yeah what i was going to say and you're also the editor and that normally really isn't the way things are done usually the editor is out there and takes that right in real movies yes you know people tend to tend to uh specialize into things like, you know, a makeup artist or a script supervisor, and then an editor will be a very specific person. Uh, in the case of the the fan films that I work on, I you know, a lot of times I tend to do both. Now, if, I, if I'm working on someone else's film, like, for example, if I'm working on Dreadnought Dominion, then Gary and Randy do that. Uh, or uh, Federation Files, Dan, Dan Reynolds will edit. But for, for the case of Interlude, yes, I was also the editor. So how did that affect the way you shot? Well, I, I had a very solid idea in mind about how the whole thing would flow. And so I, I had the edit in mind when I created the shot list and then when we were taking the shots, you know, I positioned the camera and, and, um, took specific shots knowing what I was going to use them for. Like for example, uh, we had a lot of shots that were, you know, your typical narrative film shots, you know, uh, a wide shot, a close up, uh, a medium close up, uh, a, a dolly here or there. And then we had visual effects plates like so um, when you're showing someone on the view screen. Like you see uh, Jaconde talking to Garth on the view screen, you frame up Warren Hawk dead center and have him look into the camera. If you were doing a narrative storytelling shot, you you would have him look off of the camera. You'd never want the actor to look at the camera, but since it's you know uh, a com box, so to speak, you know we set up the camera in a way that was directly in front of him, like he's looking into the view screen and had him look right into the camera, and that's what we put. Uh, in the view screen. So you, you design certain shots to be used in certain ways with the edit. It's essentially you're shooting with the edit in mind. 
And it's a process. It's a chain of process. So it's like you create the shot list in pre-production, execute that while you're shooting the film. And it makes editing so much easier when you sort of film with a purpose. I, I worked with a, um, a filmmaker once uh, and we were shooting a scene where uh, an actress was walking into a restaurant. We were outside this restaurant and she was walking up and going inside and they didn't, they hadn't planned out what they wanted to do. So we got something like 30 different angles of this actress walking up to the door and opening the door and walking in because they were so unconfident in what they were, you know, Oh, do we need another angle? And we got 30 different angles. And I, at one point I said, like, the only thing we're missing is the doorknobs point of view. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the next shot we got. So, you know, I don't, I don't roll that way. It's you waste everyone's time. And so I'm very purposeful in, in how I shoot something. Well, you, you go, you, you talk about, uh, um, shooting in like com box angle. I've heard all the greats shoot like that angle. And, uh, you know, um, I think that's very smart filmmaking, Josh shooting com box, oh, yeah. you know, you know, all the greats. <laughs> we're, do that we're not talking um, about you, right? Here. <laughs> He's always going to find a way to make it about him, isn't he? Yeah, <laughs> really. For real. I was actually trying um, to get some real information from you, Josh. <laughs> well, and we were, you know, Frank, you and I were talking about this with, with Romulan Ailes. Right. That, uh, sometimes setting up a bunch of cameras and spraying down a room isn't, isn't the best way to go. It's better to kind of think of the edit in your head, or you can use storyboards or you can have a shot list, but you're, but you're thinking about, I'm going to go from this shot to this shot to this shot. So you only take the shots you need instead of kind of trying to futz around with a lot of different stuff you may not use. So this was the first time you worked with Warren Hawk. Um, and what was that process like? Like, how did you go out to, to find, uh, was it something specific you were looking for with him or was it just happen chance of the actor that you had to stumble across or what, what exactly made you call out for the character of Chikande? So with Jaconde, Jonathan had written something very specific and he knew the kind of uh, actor that he wanted. Uh, and so the, the problem that I had is that I'm in, um, I'm in Arkansas. I'm looking for an actor in Atlanta. Victoria was, she was working on a project called Freedom's Path where she was working with like 300 actors. She was like casting like 300 background actors for a, a civil war, you know, underground railroad movie. So she was really tied up with that the, during the entirety of pre-production. So it kind of fell on me to find an actor and we were posting casting calls, but we weren't getting a lot of responses. And Jonathan was getting a little impatient because it was like, we were, I think two weeks away from actually shooting the film. And I just thought, you know, my friend Jay Plyburn, who plays Franklin in the film, had moved down there to Atlanta. And I know Jay, he's a party boy, you know, he knows everybody. And so I figured maybe I'll just call Jay and he'll have a good idea on who I should should speak to. And I got Jay on the phone and I described what I needed, you know. Uh, uh, a large and in charge African-American guy with a smooth, sexy voice. And in the first words out of his mouth were Warren Hawk. Yeah. Jefferson and, wasn't uh, available then. You guys huh? didn't know me yet. <laughs> Otherwise yeah. I'd have, I'd have been there, been right on the spot. <laughs> and, and well, so um, he gives me Warren's contact information and I, I called him and talked to him and he, indeed, if you've ever, if you've ever been around Warren. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that smooth, smooth, sexy voice. Uh, and so, um, you know, he he really wanted to do it because he, you know, he's his, he's his name is Hawk. So he's a big fan of Avery Brooks from the mm -hmm. TV series, A Man Called Hawk. And he was also he was a Star Trek fan and, of course, a fan of Captain Sisko. And so it was like a, a match made in heaven and a dream come true for him. And uh, so he I said, hey, take your phone and I sent him a script side record, you know, yourself doing these lines on your phone and send that to me. He did that and sent it to me. 
I forwarded it to Victoria. We talked about it for 10 minutes and I called him the next day and said, yeah, come, come meet us at the, the studio on this date. And he showed up and the rest is history, as they say. I've got a question going back a little bit to uh, how you're describing the role of the director of photography and the, the editor. To me, it's layman. It sounds like shooting for a film is a lot smoother when your director of photography and your editor are the same person. But it sounds like that's hardly ever the case or that's not a normal thing. Yeah. So my question is, is that if it makes more sense, if it makes it more efficient for the director of photography to be the editor, then why is it more normal for that to be two different people and not the same person? Because you may have an editor working on another film while the director of photography is shooting a film. So they, they, you know, there might be a film in progress. They're editing one film, that one goes out the door and then another one comes in. And in Hollywood, there's your, or, or the larger film industry as a whole, what you'll have is the, the director a lot of times will actually be the person who determines what the coverage is going to be. Um, and the, 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 the director and the DP may coordinate that, but a lot of times the director of the, the film specifically will know what the, what coverage they want to shoot because they're the visual storyteller. And, um, they'll have camera assistants who create camera logs. And so they, they, okay, on this card, this is what we shot. There'll be a, you know, a digital digital station where that stuff will be put on hard drives. Then it will be taken to assistant editors that will log that footage and, and feed it into the editing software. And you'll have pe everybody from the director to maybe somebody from the studio to, um, assistant editors and people will review the dailies as they're called the, any footage shot on a, on a day and go through it and go, okay, this is what we've got, make notes. Um, and the director will have a lot of say on, on what, how the, the film gets cut. And so, you know, being, being purposeful, um, and how you shoot is, is a coordinated process on a bigger production, but, for Victoria, that wasn't something that she had a lot of experience with. So she sort of kind of relied on me to, 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 to design the visual look of the film. But of course she gave her own input uh, on what she thought, you know, what coverage she thought we should get, like, get, can you get me a shot of this? Or, and she gave, definitely gave her own notes on how she thought things should be cut as did Jonathan. And that was a source of a lot of the, the tension that people talk about is that when we got to post-production, Jonathan really wanted to take control of the process because it was his story. And, that's kind of the point where it more than anything de degenerated into a, a tug of war between Jonathan and Victoria with me stuck in the middle. Uh, so in, in that regard, the, the director, so you had the director and the, and the, and the writer mm -hmm. uh, wanting to be that one in, in the editing bay to yeah. use this shot, do that. Is that something that, that happens? No, often? Who's, who's usually the one that's, uh, that that's behind you driving the wheel. Is that usually the, the director that uh, well, works how, with how the editor? It, yeah. How it'll normally, how it works on a standard production process is you'll have uh, the writer of the film. Once they've written the film, they don't continue on with the process at all. And that's on purpose because um, I'll give you an example. I worked on a film where the writer was also the first AD and he was involved with filming it. And the, the director was like really distracted because he was also the producer. And so he was distracted with stuff. And the, the guy who was the writer like took over the shoot and was sort of sabotaging the way that scenes were shot to make sure that none of his, his dialogue got cut. And then he was like, you know, telling the actors how to perform the parts and stuff. And it was, uh, you, you, you can't have the writer on the set because then the writer's going to be like, but this is, this is what I, how I thought we should do it. And that's just another person to argue with people. And that's why you don't, you don't have that person in the process. Uh, most of the they time, always, 
once the script is handed off to the director, the director is responsible for getting it done. Now, you may have a, a chain process where the editor does a cut, the director gives notes, the editor revises, and then it may eventually go to uh, an executive producer or, or a person at the studio who will look at it and get, give whatever limited notes they have. See, but, this but, is but no, it's was, not normal. But Jonathan was also the executive producer, and he was also the one driving the process. So he he made the decision to be more involved with the edit than than the executive producer would normally be. Well, they always say that there's there's several different versions of a movie. There's the one that you have in your head that you think up. There's the one that you write that gets changed from what you think up. There's the one that you shoot that actually gets changed from the one that you wrote, the one that got thought of. And then there's the one that you edit that gets changed from the one that was directed, that gets changed from the one that was written. So a movie goes through several different versions from the one that was created from just the thought process. And that's something that when you have the writer there, that's kind of hindering the entire process. Like you, you can't have a movie um, that that is just completely controlled. And that's something that people have to realize is once you bring somebody else on board, it now becomes a, a group process. And that's something that we are supposed to learn in kindergarten um, yeah. is, you know, that, that sharing is caring, you know. Um, and, you know, we, we have to share that. Uh, it, it is a creative process making a film. So obviously the, the CGI was really impressive with this film. Um, how heavy uh, were you in that process of, of getting the CGI with, uh, with this? Were you, were you heavy involved with that or was it something you kind of just passed off to Jonathan? Um, Cause it was really impressive all the, the shots, but was that something when you were directing it that you were like, I want this to go with this scene. So I'm going to film it this way. Right. Was it something you were just like, eh, ho- I'm going to shoot it this way and suck it. Hopefully it works out. <laughs> no. Well, so there was, um, the first little sequence there at the beginning, the first like three or four shots were, 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 were done for like the Kickstarter or whatever, the, the GoFundMe, like Jonathan made a video for the GoFundMe and he had that sequence already built with, with a friend of his who was the, the VFX artist. And then from those, maybe after those first three or four shots on, I designed that. So I did a complete shot list beginning to end and described in detail what those CG shots would look like. Like, for example, the one where the, we follow the torpedo and stuff like that. Like I, I created a shot list and detailed out what those would look like, sent those to the artist. That person created it, sent it back. Um, there were, there were some notes Jonathan added like one or two shots. Um, and then um, there was another shot that was kind of a group sort of planned out shot. When we got deep into the edit and we went, well, we want enough, we want one more shot or we want. And so that was, that was kind of, there was a kind of a group discussion on that. And it was the shot where you see like K7 station destroyed. And, uh, and so like one person was like, I want to see K7 and another person's like, I want to see this. And then I kind of had the idea that you'd have the, the Klingon ship coming down, like in star Trek six and flying over the camera. And so that was my contribution to that. So that was kind of a, that one shot was a group thing, but most of those shots during the battle were, were preconceived by me. And then the artist did it, sent it to us. We gave notes and went back and forth. Yeah, it was nice. Those those were nice shots that you had in there. And that was one of the things that uh, I liked the camera movement. Anytime I see a film where uh, you, do, you do something a little more dynamic with it instead of, uh, okay, the, the camera is going to be put on a tripod and it's going to be a static shot where you know, the, the, the people might move, but the, the camera does not. Now I'm not talking getting crazy. Like, uh, you know, the early transformers, Michael Bay movies, where you have no <laughs> idea what the hell's going on because the camera's all over the place and, and zoomed in on everything. But I, I like kind of more of that, that sort of free form motion. Like you're just kind of very gradually, maybe steadily just sort of moving it, it, and it's not that you're even trying to intentionally move. It just feels like, okay, this is, this is not on a, a static thing. Somebody could be saying they're holding it and they're, they're still kind of like, you know, you can't 
necessarily stand still completely. There's little movement in there. Um, I've grown to kind of to kind of like that sort of thing in um, cinematography and, and filming. Yeah, I try to be somewhat purposeful in moving the camera when I can. I mean, adding a production value is a legitimate reason to move the camera, but you you don't want to overdo it. And 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 yeah, you have the two extremes where it's like you can have the the briefing room scene from from a fan film where like the camera never moves and it's just people talking for like ten minutes. Uh, I remember there was one there was a scene in a fan film and it was uh, it was years and years ago. And the camera never moved in this briefing room scene. And it was eight minutes long and Vance called me and he was talking about it. And he was like, that briefing room scene made me angry. You know, and he was like getting real worked up about it. And, and But then you get, you get the other side of it, which is like, you have a briefing room scene in discovery where like the, the camera will not stop orbiting the crew, the entire scene and you're getting seasick. You know what I mean? So you have to kind of find a good, uh, a good media, you know, middle ground there with, with moving the camera. And that's why I say be purposeful. Now at the same time, we, we were a little too static for my taste in some respects with interlude, like a lot of the camera movement you see in the version that's out, like the shaking of the camera and stuff is added in post. And that's where I first started doing mm -hmm. that, doing it in post in the previous film fan films I did, I would actually shake the camera and it was interlude where I started doing it and editing, but it was like, Jonathan didn't want me shaking the camera. I wanted to, I wanted to fill the bridge with smoke. I wanted flashing lights. I wanted sparks. And, and if I'd had my way, we would have done all of that stuff and, and we didn't, but I, I'm doing plenty of that now. If you've ever seen the lost starship, um, that's all over the place. And then the one we're, we're about to release that may be out around the same time this comes out, the death of the war is going to have a lot of that too. So when, when we get to the second part of Romulan Ales and we get to the battle scene, you can come down and shoot because I want smoke and flashes and all that stuff too. <laughs> but you know, I was going to ask you, Josh, because we've started using this. What do you think of doing the gimbals in the steady cams? So the, so yeah, well, they're two very different things, but, yeah. but they will, they will help you do sort of the same thing. Um, you know, steady cam is very purposeful and you're going to, you're going to, move it and turn it and all kinds of things. And there, it, there's like this big vest and it's mm -hmm. the, somebody who, somebody who runs a steady cam is somebody who uh, has done it for a very long time and has practiced with it. It's not a skill you can pick up right away. How I'm going to use a gimbal would be like uh, two characters are walking down a really long corridor talking. Yeah. There's a there's a shot in Crisis where Jaconde and Mirror Allenby are are they walk almost completely down the 100 foot corridor at Neutral Zone Studios and the camera tracks with them. That's camera right. on again. Um, or let's say um, you're trying to do something like Star Trek 09 at, at the very beginning where uh, the, the, the battle with the, the Kelvin and the in the camera kind of moves from one station to the next. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of, it's kind of a constant thing. And it, you know, you, you, you might use a gimbal for that. Um, again, that's a, that's a thing that you're going to design. You're going to say it has a beginning, middle and an end. It starts here. It covers this action or this dialogue and it ends there. You don't kind of just kind of surf with it. Sorry again for our audience. Okay. What's a gimbal? Oh. So, okay. So a gimbal with a, with a camera is it's going to be an action apparatus that has motors and like if you were to just walk around with your camera it'd be real shaky like say you just like were walking around somewhere it would bounce up and down while you're walking and, and, and when for, you put for, it on the gimbal the gimbal is like a gyro stabilized kind of deal where it holds the camera steady so that you know while you're moving it's smooth okay and i ha i have the difference between josh using a gimbal and not using a gimbal is his is very smooth and it flows. And me, I have not used a gimbal and it bounces and you can hear me huffing and puffing because I have to actually walk and it's not a pretty sight 
or good for audio and it just sucks so you should probably use a gimbal because well, yeah, we, we have been you well the reason i was saying that is i wanted to see how josh used it because i mean some of the shots we did last time is you know when i was sitting in the captain's chair uh Jason would, you know, go to communications, you know, to get that flow when she was giving the lines back and forth. Yeah. In, in, yeah, you, you know, could, you could like, you could start on your comm officer and pull, pull back and go over to the captain or something like that. Yeah. And they, and they make gimbals for cameras. They make them for phones. Yeah. And that's what we've been using. Of course we use, as you well know, the advanced method of photography for crossroads. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which you go. No. <laughs> Heavy breathing in the background, walking, wheezing. No, no, no. My sound, it's, I run it through this AI that it's my almost, friend and Josh found, Adobe online, and everything I do now, I run through that program. Hey, I like my fan films to sound like they're on Pornhub, okay? So let's... You know, I've been trying to get the cage fixed. <laughs> I'm having trouble getting the whole wind out. Man, yeah. like, fuck it, I'm doing static shots from now on. <laughs> oh, shoot. So... Uh, all total, I, I know this is a pretty long movie that was in post uh, that was in post for for quite a while. Um, it was what a year and a half, two years that you you spent making this movie, Josh. Okay, so uh, Jonathan contacted me about it. I want to say in November or December of 2018. And then we released it. We released version one in april of 2021 and then we finally got to the final version version three which is what's out now uh in december of 2021 so the whole process was uh basically three years from from you know the end of 2019 to the end of 2021 and you've actually taken this regardless of what version to film festivals and it's actually won some awards, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, it's won it's one uh, you know, best fan film and stuff that like Austin Indie Fest, it won Indie Boom. Uh Jonathan would know better than me, but he entered it into a lot of festivals and it yeah, it did very, very well. Um very few films have I worked on for three years, especially one that you know, I wouldn't normally work on a film that's 10 minutes long for three years, but um, like, for example, we spent almost an entire year just on pre-production and planning. Um, and there's this 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 infamous story that we're, we're I, I feel like Jonathan kind of obsesses over details a little too much. And I would make fun of him for that and give him a hard time. And he's like. Uh, I, I woke up in a cold sweat and uh, I realized that we didn't have any tables or chairs for uh, anyone to eat lunch on. I'm like, call the, find a place and rent some tables, you know, like you woke up in a cold sweat. I mean, why? <laughs> but, but he, he does, he, he's a perfectionist and he obsesses over the details. I remember in, in post, it was like, if, if you were working on some detail, like, you know, the way the shuttles would fly by in the background of the interview shots, he would obsess over the flight path of the shuttles and uh, how transparent they were with the clouds. And uh, it was it was weeks at a time on any given detail you can think of. And it was it was quite maddening. It sounds like it was a hell of a process. <laughs> um. You know, I, I will say people people tend to think that, like, because there is a tie in with Axanar that Alec was heavily involved. He wasn't. He wasn't involved almost at all. The only the only involvement Alec had was he showed up for two days and, and acted. Um, I mean, there were various points where he offered his criticisms um, but those criticisms were just offered as opinions. It wasn't like he would go to Jonathan and say, this is what you're going to do. And when he would offer his thoughts to, to Jonathan, be like, yeah, Jonathan, this is what I think you should do. Hey, listen. And Jonathan would be like, uh, thank you for your opinion, Alec. Uh, I think I'll do what I was going to do anyway. 
you know? And, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, people, people tend to think that Jonathan is like a lap dog for Alec and he really isn't. I mean, uh, I've seen the two men argue and, um, it's just, it's actually just not the case. Right. Well, and I, I like hearing your insight on the behind the scenes and just the things that happen with these films that when you're watching it, you don't know about if you're not there. Uh, the, the last question that I have for you, I don't know if uh, V man and Frank have others, but the, the last one that I have for you is if there was one thing you could go back and change that you just were not happy with, is there such a, a shot or a scene? And if so, what would you change? So what I would change about this would have nothing to do with what ended up on screen because I, um, I'm pretty, pretty pleased actually with what we ended up with. Um, I felt like despite all of the conflict that the film we ended up with was something that because it was such a compromise, it's a compromise to be really proud of because it could have, you, you've seen this, you've never seen what it could have been. And I felt like we, we ended up with a film that despite everything that happened, I'm, I'm really satisfied with how it turned out. Um, what I would change would be my attitude and my approach to the process because, um, and that's the thing that I take away from this film the most. Um, you know, people talk about credit, you know, who gets credit for this, who gets credit for that. For me, the most valuable part of a filmmaking experience is the, the experience itself. What do you learn? How does this film make you a better filmmaker? What I walked away from this film with was a lot more patience that I had when I entered the process. I, I left with a thicker skin than I had when I started. And if I had it to do over again, I, I would have, I would be much more calm and level headed. I wouldn't have got it. I wouldn't get as angry as I got about things during this process. I would just kind of chill and, 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 and let it happen and make my points rationally instead of getting pissed off and being frustrated. Um, yeah, I was supposed to, I was originally asked to direct this film by Jonathan. And then there came a point where when he learned that Victoria helped me co-direct Avalon lost, he was like, Oh, uh, well, maybe you can uh, co-direct interlude as well. And, um, Mm -hmm. He's what he's going to say when he sees this is uh, your your impression of me really isn't very good. Uh, I think it's great, but <laughs> <laughs> but but so he he kept asking. This episode like, recording is going to start a fist fight. I just know it. <laughs> so he he um he says you know do you want her to be involved and I was really uncomfortable with the notion. I really was for a variety of reasons. One. Uh, one of the most important skill sets you can develop as a filmmaker is to take somebody else's story and make somebody else's story and interpret it. That's something that you will do in real film. And so I wanted the opportunity to do that. And, and I knew that if she became involved, I would become more of what I ended up doing, which is the, the camera director of photography role. And she would end up directing actors and stuff. And I, I wanted the opportunity to direct the actors. Secondly, I I didn't want to bring her on to another fan film project because I was worried she would become burnt out on fan films. And, and I didn't need that. I needed her to focus on what we were doing. And then finally, I didn't want there to be some kind of weird conflict between her and I. And all of that materialized because she came on board. And so... I, he would ask me about it and I would get kind of nervous and say, you know, I really don't know about this, Jonathan. And then finally he just called her one day. They, they talked without me there, then called me and I was kind of put on the spot and I had to be like, okay, I guess I'm going to agree to this. And it, it, I went through the entire process of making this movie frustrated about that. And it reflected far too much into my you know, failing in this 
process. And so if I could do it over, when, when that question was posed to me, I'd say, no, I'm not very comfortable with her being involved. And I would just stand up for myself and say, you know, I'm not trying to be a jerk about this, but you offered me this opportunity. You don't offer someone an opportunity like that and then turn around and give it to someone else. Um, and I would just be a little bit more firm and standing up for myself. And then secondly, if I found myself in that situation, I would try to handle it with a lot more grace than what I did. Third, the, the process of, of going and working hard and then having somebody come barrage you with notes. I wasn't very used to it back then. And that was really hard and frustrating to deal with. Now it's something I do all the time. Like I make, you know, uh, seven TV commercials a week sometimes. And, and I might get seven or eight rounds of notes on a, on something like that. That's a client. You have to, you can't, they don't care what you think. You just, you make their TV commercial. And so I, I, I took the, the hard knocks that I got from this production and I used them to make me a better person and a better filmmaker. I wish I could have been that when we did it, but you know, I needed that experience to, to help me down the road. That's excellent. Well said Vance, Frank, you guys got anything? No, I'm pretty no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Good. <laughs> Josh, thank you again for sitting down with us. Anytime we get a chance to talk with you, it's a pleasure. I love learning about all the behind the scenes stuff with filming and directing photography and, and all of that, because uh, when you're talking, I, my ideas are in my head on different ways of, of doing different things, because uh, one of these days I'm going to be shooting my own thing. Um, and so, you know, using you guys for inspiration. Uh, but thank you for joining us. It you need was, help, let us know. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a pleasure and uh, we'll certainly stay in touch. And I know we're going to have you on here again soon. Okay. Thank All you. Right. So th everyone's listening and watching. Thank you for joining us and live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can support us at patreon.com slash beyond Trek. We are Beyond Trek Podcast. Lower your inhibitions and surrender your years. We will add inspirational and hilarious Trek content to your day. Your attention will adapt to subscribe to us. Resistance is futile.